Welcome to the Jockey Club, a podcast looking at the movie Let It Ride, one scene at a time. My name is Dan Delgado, and we're at historic Hylia Park where one man is having the best day of his life. I'm having a good day. So come on in and hang out while we talk about this day and the greatest movie of all time, Let It Ride. Don't worry about that guy at the door. I've got you covered. You can even take my seat to the Jockey Club. Welcome back to the Jockey Club. My name is Dan Delgado. We are up to episode 25, which means that we are doing the 25th scene of Let It Ride. And really, it's the 25th scene, go ahead, say it with me, according to me. This is the scene where Trotter returns to Marty's bar to call home to speak with Pam. Back again with me to discuss this scene is the keeper of the screenplay himself, Mr. James David Patrick. James is not merely a huge fan of Let It Ride. He is also the host of the Cinema Shame podcast and the writer of the official Netflix DVD blog. There's a link to the Cinema Shame podcast in the show description. And I also want to remind you that we do have some merchandise out there for sale. So if you cannot live without a Jockey Club t-shirt or mug, we have you covered. Again, there's a link to that in the show notes as well. Now, if you are playing along, this is going to be from minute 105.58 to 108.57. So now let's head on up to my usual table at the Jockey Club to discuss the wonders of drunk acting and the 25th scene of Let It Ride. Okay, so let's start this off. (laughs) So here we have trotter returning to marty's bar this is his return to the bar after his jockey club experience he is walking not alone but with reardon and the money box now we have a money box the money box i love how reardon is just always reardon all the time as soon as they walk in nobody make a false move as as he's as they're walking into the bar as though false moves were about to happen yes Everyone was just twitchy. Yes, yes. Oh, and Marty's observation. He looks different. Is he looks this different. Is this a height thing? Is this because there's the money's out of the shoes? I think it's swagger at this point. I don't I don't think we're making another shoe joke. So I, I think this is about his swagger into the bar, his confidence that he's bringing with him. He looks like a different man. He doesn't look like a loser anymore. That's right. That's right. All of a sudden, everything has changed. I, I'm totally with you on that. That is what I was thinking. But, you know, we've done this shoe joke several times. But, yeah, and it, it's not that he looks, hey, he looks, he has shrunk again. It's not that. It's, he looks different. Okay. So, Trotter's going to go into the back by the bathroom to make a phone call. And here, we're going to give Reardon his moment in the movie. Right? And he's got He's got a dandy of a line here, too. It's not 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 one specific line is delivered in a way that we can rank among the Dreyfusisms that we've gathered throughout this podcast. <laughs> okay, and All he right. starts out. There is now a man throwing. Oh, I should I should wind back up. I have peripheral vision. It's a gift. I can see there's a guy throwing up in in the pool table to my left. The guy's asleep on the table to my right. The bulbs is burned out overhead, and the last line he delivers. There's a fly in the money box. There's a fly on the money box. And this has, like, unnerved him a lot more than anything else. The fly in the money box is really starting to creep up on him. (laughs) He says it, yes, with such a, I don't know, not quite hysteria, but we're ratcheting up in that direction. In fact, that's probably the name of this episode is there's a fly (laughs) on the money box. I love that line. I love how he delivers it. And this little hilarious speech that is completely unnecessary, but he feels the need to let everyone know just how damn serious he is about protecting the money box, that it's another example where all these little tiny characters seem to get a nice moment here or there. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the really, this is Reardon's best moment, is it not? Yeah, I mean, this this is the time it's only focused on him. Dreyfus isn't around. Like, this is Reardon. Full frame. He gets one banger line. And 
he's had his moment. That's it. That's it. And it's, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's like 20 seconds long that we're talking about. But, but still, I just love how every so often one of these minor characters has sort of a moment to shine. And then we're going to get to, I guess, the meat of this scene, which is where Trotter calls home. Trotter calls Pam. Let's to... press pause on the call home. Oh, go ahead. Let's go to the screenplay. What does the screen? I feel like I should have some sort of a, like, you know, a sound for this. What does the screenplay say? You need it. I need a jingle. The Jockey Club presents Let's Go to the Screenplay with James David Patrick. We've excised a large portion. We've excised an entire page, really, of this scene. Uh, after the flies in the money box, uh-huh. we have an exchange of all of the bar patrons. There's a, it would have been a rapid fire kind of talking over. I don't know. I was trying to listen to it today. I amplified it a little bit more to see because as Dreyfus walks into make the call, you can hear background chatter and it's sort of nonspecific. I wanted to know if some of those lines that were being spoken were from the screenplay and he like Altman it where it's just in the background and isn't a focus, but it doesn't, I, I didn't, I couldn't really make out what was being said and it didn't seem like it was anything from the screenplay, but I, I say this not because it, it just for the fact of it, but Marty gets a line here that I think is really kind of interesting. So to Sid is Sid is talking to Evangeline vibes is vibing. He says the guy will blow it all classic self-destructive the whole bit. It's now a reverse vibe. <laughs> it's now a I, reverse. Oh, why do we, which I thought was that? kind of funny. Yeah, no, that's a good line. And, and we have more loony like, going his about face like one of the great people of our day a real friend a trooper and we have to call back to one of my older episodes and barfly hugh sipes this character oh yeah that's he, right that's right said he knew hitler he says it again he says i knew hitler what a cocksucker just like to recall the same line which again i thought was kind of funny mm-hmm. from a like reading the screenplay as like a callback maybe not so funny in the movie but kind of funny on the page and this is where Marty says, here my pick of the day in the first race comes in second, loses a photo. Nobody even knows I'm alive. So Marty's making the case, you know, like, I'm I'm that guy any other day. Like, I could be that guy. He could be me. You lose that first race, nothing happens. Yeah, wait, do you think, though, that maybe he's thinking along the lines of, hey, you know what? My horse, it showed my pick, it was a 40-star pick, and it came in second. And if you bet it to show, then you would have won Where's My Glory for My Geniusness. I just think it's a, it's a little more Marty. Like, we get a little bit of the character here grousing in the background. Mm-hmm. Like, that could have been me. I could have been having that. It was just an interesting side because we don't get anything from Marty anywhere else, really. Just, Not really. Just the rote conversation. So this is a, kind of a Marty moment. And then the rest, we have another Vibes he, he says there's icicles hanging on all the letters like he's vibing. And that's just another <laughs> totally out of nowhere line. It, it's such a shame that that is not filmed. I just would love to have another couple of minutes of all of those. I, would kind of, I, I want this as an outtake to know. Like, yes! I don't know if it needs to be in here, but as an outtake, that would have been golden. And, and Luffy comes in for some reason. He's in the scene. Well, you know, that makes sense. When Trotter emerges from the phone call. Oh, right, right, right. Lufkin is one of the people that's staring at him. And it's, yeah, it is a little interesting that he's hanging around there. I don't know that I would necessarily expect him to be inhabiting both of the. Obviously, he preys upon the people at Marty's bar, but he's hanging out in the jockey yeah. club. I don't know. And, in, and into to Marty's line, nobody knows I'm alive. Lufkin says, bet some football, and I'll know you're alive. Open a window. And then he says, bet hockey. So, I mean, we're just, it's just, it's going to be one of those scenes that everybody's talking over each other. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's no real flow. And uh, yeah, all that got axed. What a shape. Hey, but wait, no cheeseburger in this scene? No cheeseburger. That's a pity. There's not enough. I'll tell you what, if there's one guy, there's not We could have used on. more cheeseburger. Absolutely. He's, of all the bar guys, he's my favorite bar guy. He's my favorite yeah. of these little characters. He kills it. That guy kills it. All right. So, you know, and speaking of 
things like like what you were just talking about, where you were trying to hear if it was in the background. All right. So in the previous scene, which is Trotter gives Looney the money to pay off Lufkin. He gives it to Johnny Casino, right? Yeah. So at the end of that scene, he gives the money to Looney or he and Looney takes or Casino takes it right out of his hand. And then Trotter stands there and he says, somebody owes me a little bit of change. I, I don't think I had ever heard this until just before I came on with you, mm-hmm. where you can hear in the background after he says that, that Casino says to Looney off camera, he says, I don't know, I, I, hey, Looney or Looney. And then Looney responds with, that's Mr. Looney to you. Mm-hmm. Is that new information for you? Or is, I mean, that's it. It doesn't obviously. Doesn't really There's a little more anything. chatter there. I, I don't remember specifically. There's a little more chatter in that scene because I read it earlier, but didn't pay close attention to it. There's a few lines excised at the end of at the end of that scene that don't make it in. So there may have been more to that. OK, well, I was just I'm. It, you know, it's something I guess maybe when you're listening to it with when you're watching it and you've got headphones on. You're going to hear some things that maybe you would not normally hear. So those two lines at the end there, Mr. Looney to you, that was just like, whoa, what am I hearing? Because it does sound like it's, it's it's not very clear. It almost sounds like it's just coming from somewhere else in the room as I'm sitting here. I'm like, oh, OK, an extra line. Very cool. All right. So now let now can we go home for a second? Yes. Now, we, right. now let's proceed. Let's call home. By the way, I think this is if I were to audition for any mm-hmm. production. And I had to go in cold with my rehearsed material. Yes, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do Pam's drunken tirade on the phone here. Is that as what, my performance piece? Yeah. And, and what? All right. So just out of curiosity, what is it about this drunken piece or you know drunken bit of Pam? I love drunk like? dialogue. Yes. Drunk dialogue is harder than it seems. Mm-hmm. When you're writing it, hearing it, so listening to Terry Gar do this scene is magic. <laughs> and and a lot of it, I was surprised because when you're watching it, I you you get the sense that Terry Gar is sort of having her way with it, like in the moment. You know, she drops the phone just yes. to speed up a little bit. We'll come back, and he's like, "Oh my god, there's no way that's." part of it because it seems like oh i dropped the phone like it seems so natural in the scene like oh maybe she just did that and that was what worked really well but she does in the, in the script that's in there she drops the phone like she doesn't th- there's no there's no direction for it but she says oops dropped the phone as, as she didn't hear so the way that she reads it is is so natural and I just kind of fell in love with her rhythm, specifically the way that the whole thing is delivered. As I said, it's pretty note for note from the screenplay. I made a couple of of notes where it shifts a little bit. But, I mean, this is all Terry Gar. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I had wondered, actually, as I was watching it, is that an improv where she drops the phone? So I'm glad you pointed that out. There's a... The line... The only thing that she... Or was added, she added, I'm going to drink every day, morning, noon, and night. And then she says, bottles of gin, beer, six packs. I'm going to hide the bottles around the house. Mm-hmm. The bottles, gin, beer, six packs, and I'll hide the bottle. That's not in there. Okay, got it. But yeah, it's 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 the rhythm of this scene. And, and I watched it over and over again today as I was noting what how, how it sounded and going back through it. And it's, I, I just kept finding it funnier and funnier, like, it's it's the little the little way she shifts some sentences because you know when you're drunk there really isn't a delineation between one sentence to the other mm-hmm. it they kind of all go together or there's huge pauses right so when she she says right after that six packs and hide the bottles on the house I'm never going to cook or clean and then she just or 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 take baths like that somehow. <laughs> related to the cooking and the clean the general personal cleanliness is somehow related to the cooking and cleaning of the the duties of a housewife is to is to cook clean and you know not stink take baths or take baths but it's it's the little or 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 as she kind of puts the pieces together of, of what she's saying and and the way then she segs into almost without punctuation and you can sell the bed if you want to 
It's all the make bad. Bets with it. Make bets make with bets it. With it. <laughs> make bets with it. Make bets with it. I think that's that's the key part there. It's not just to sell it, but to make bets with it. Yes. So yeah. you can keep doing your thing that's going to lead to the and, to and the, the refrigerator. I don't care about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's very key that Pam is drunk in the scene. So Trotter is calling her to tell her, hey, guess what? I won that bet. We're pretty rich, right? I've got $69,000. We're pretty rich, he says. Pretty rich. <laughs> Even so, though he said he has zero. I mean, he's pretty rich. He's pretty rich. Well, you know, in his, in his mathematics is 12 years of rent. 12 years of rent. At that terrible place that he's, that he's renting out, probably. That, yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Maybe you want to do something else. All right. So here's my question. Here's my big James question. If Pam goes home and does not get drunk, she decides to just sit and watch television or do something else, but she's home. Trotter calls and she's still sober. Do we get the fourth race? Is the movie over right here? <laughs> If she, well, that's the thing, right? Because she's she says she can't live without him, so she's going to become an alcoholic. Yes, I like th- that's that's the better alternative. So if she doesn't become an alcoholic, mm-hmm. or she just waits, yeah, a I half think she hour still stays. I don't think I, I think then it becomes it becomes something else. Then it becomes a marriage story, and nobody wants nobody wants let it ride to turn into a marriage story. Yeah, I suppose we don't. I suppose we don't. But I, I want this version of a marriage story. I want yeah. I, I want them just getting super drunk and going, you know what? I hate you, but I love you, and I can't live without you, so this is how I'm coping, and let's just do it. Oh, that sounds so depressing, James. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> it is what happens. I don't... All right. Let's not even focus on that, all right? So... Here's what I'm thinking, though. I'm thinking the movie ends. He goes home with $69,000. Is she happy with him? And she says, okay, now promise me you'll never bet again. And then, then it's a happy ending. And he pays 12 years of rent. And, and they stay there until well, that, 2001. 12, year, 12 years of rent is really sexy. Yeah, I'm going to guess. It. She's probably not going to allow 12 years of rent. Certainly not wherever the hell they're living. Not at that uh, apartment. No. Not at that uh, duplex. Yeah, we need we need that that propulsion. So drunk Pam becomes the catalyst. He comes home, yes, and he's like, it's it's a weird turning point for our character because he's getting everything he wants in this moment, and it's like you said, sort of depressing if you break it down from from the angle of this is the only way your wife can cope with you <laughs> yes stay drunk all the time all of a sudden it's like yeah. it, it's, it, it you know becomes somewhere in a leaving las vegas territory yeah yeah and and in response he takes the money and bets again oh one okay. more time oh yeah yeah well so the audience needs this because at, at at this point we don't want him to quit, right? And we also we have a tumultuous relationship with Terry Gar, who is both the only sane human in the movie and the immaculate buzzkill. Absolutely! Oh my goodness! Yes, yes. First time I saw this movie, I'm shocked that he's not going to run off with Vicky as opposed to going home the, the with, nagging with shrew right yes, yes absolutely that's that yeah yes. of course that's where how you see this as a 14 year old but you know <laughs> uh, now when i watch this and i watch this scene that we're talking about and he tells her that he loves her and she says it back to him and he says do you mean that like there's something that's like oh there's something tender that's going on in this scene for a, a moment <laughs> and mean s- what <laughs> I mean, Trotter, it's so funny. Like, does he not know that she loves him? Did did he think that she had fallen out of love with him when she left the jockey club after he comes well, you're, back you're with fishing. the 48 win like, tickets? He He's coming back. This phone call is sort of tail between my legs. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I'm so sorry. I have screwed up everything, but look at all the money I have because I'm a massive fuck up. Mm-hmm. He's trying to have it every which way. Yeah. Right. He's trying to be the hero and admit that he was totally wrong. And, but look how wrong I am. I have $69,000. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it? Isn't it? Does, <laughs> if he goes home, does he quit betting? Well, clearly not. Uh, <laughs> And then the question is, do you yeah. think even after he wins all this money, is this the last bet he places? No. No, probably not. <laughs> it's probably not. Yeah. I could actually see there's a, a point after the movie where he has not gone to the track for like a year or two or maybe even a little bit longer. But then somebody else is going. He runs into somebody. He ends up back there. And then it's just, you know, it's just, it's just all over That's again. It. It's, it's all over again. It's, yeah. it's in him. It's I mean, an this, inevitable spiral. I mean, he has a very. I mean, he's a, he, it's a very good day. This, I'm having a very good day. Yes, he is. He's going to have a few other bad days too. I think we can safely assume. It's, it's more than likely. I would say that's what's going to happen. <laughs> All right. So once he finishes his call with Pam, he goes back out and Ridden wa- asks the question: "What do you want to do with the box of assets?" <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great way right. of putting the, the, the money box, the box of yep. assets. But then everyone at the bar, and I find it fascinating how, how Lufkin is there as well, as though he's part of the gang, as though he's part of the you know, myriad of fun people that we love hanging out with. Well, he's part of the ecosystem. I mean, that, I think we've established that this is an entire ecosystem. It certainly is. And there's parasites and, mm-hmm. and the chum and everything in between. There's the predators. I mean... Everyone subsists because of the other one, right? Mm, yes. So one doesn't happen without the other. I mean, everybody has reached this sort of symbiosis state where even the bad guys are just part of it. I guess so, right? Because I always think of how when Trotter first sees him and Johnny Casino, the look on his face, he, he kind of growls to no Raises one. The, the growl. Yeah, yeah, the growl when he sees them. But now they're just... We, we want to know what's going on with the money. Yes, what's going on? Is Lufkin in the scene where the we're going to bet it together scene? Is he in there as well? I don't remember him in it. Yeah. But he might be. There's a lot of people around the bar. I, I was noting that in this scene in particular, when they when they pan in there, the bar is is now rather populated with people we don't know. Like it's 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 kind of actually busy compared to where we were before, where it seemed like we had known everybody that was still that was in, actually in the bar. Yeah, yeah. Like when we get to that scene, there's a bunch of people there that, you know, like bikers. It looks I mean, like there's the rest of the losers that have now lost all their money and now they're in the bar. Right. That's true. So, you know, sometimes some losers may end up showing up later on in the day. Not yeah. everybody's on the same schedule, James. It's perfectly understandable. Right. Yeah. Well, they last a little longer. Maybe they were only betting two dollars. That could be. That's generally how I would I would operate. They were betting show. <laughs> they were betting show. <laughs> <laughs> See that? If if they paid attention to the 40-star system, it would have worked out for them. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Jockey Club. This episode was hosted and produced by me, Dan Delgado. Thank you to my guest, James David Patrick. Look for James's podcast, Cinema Shame, wherever you got this podcast from. And yes, like I told you already, there is a link to it in the show description. You can also find a link to get yourself some Jockey Club merch there as well. Our theme music is from Epidemic Sound. Our cover art is by Sean Labrie. If you enjoyed this episode, and you know that I hope that you did, then you can help the show out by buying me a coffee. This is really a thing. There's a link in the show notes on how to do it. Now, if you're saving up all your pennies to bet on the four horse, well, listen, your pal Dan understands. You can still support the show by leaving a free five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening to this. Go ahead, see if there's a review option there. Check it out. I would also suggest that you pick up the Let It Ride Blu-ray from Imprint Films. If you want to contact me, you are more than welcome to do so. My email is dan at moviemaker.com. On Twitter, I am at underscore Dan underscore Delgado. Or even better, I'm on the Repod app, which is a great way to not only listen to podcasts, but to interact with podcast hosts like myself. Find it in your app store. Come on by and say hello. 
This has been Dan Delgado for the Jockey Club. And remember, sometimes you could be walking around lucky and not even know it. There's a fly on a money box.